One of the great things about living in the Chicago area is that we live close to uh, this place. Let me bring it up. Six Flags, Great America. And I want to know, uh, just to get you interacting here, is uh, how many people have been to Six Flags in the past five years? All right. Okay, some yes, some no. And I don't know about you, but when I go to Six Flags, I have a game plan for when I go. For example, I know which rides I can go on and which rides I cannot go on. For a while, back in high school, I could go on everything that just had a big drop. The giant drop, awesome. The Viper, American Eagle, that's fine. Just don't spin me upside down, that's bad news. Batman, as cool as that ride is, is not good for this guy. All right? I've recently discovered my limits have changed. I cannot go on the Whizzer without getting sick. It's awful. It's really awful. And so this is important to me, though, because I need to know my limits before I go in order to avoid bad news, right? Some of you might go to Six Flags and you know this is what I can go on, this is what I can't go on. I can do the Looney Tune cars, I can do the Viper, the American Eagle, um, but I won't do the Raging Bull too much. Or maybe you say, I, I can do everything, but I will not do that spinny sick machine where the floor drops out. Like, whoever can handle those, more power to you, you get like a special award for being strong. That's just a sick machine. And I'm being euphemistic when I say sick. Um, that's bad, right? But you gotta know. You don't want to get on there and say, I can't handle this. And so you approach Six Flags with limits. This is what I'm gonna do and this is what I'm not gonna do. As we transition into our lives as Christians, Today we're talking about following Jesus and how far we would go in following him. And I believe it is a temptation for you and I to say, I will follow God with limits. I will follow up to this point, but not any further. God, I don't want you to call me into a situation that I perceive is scary or too much. God, I don't want you to call me into a situation where, where I feel uncomfortable or, or where it's uncharted territories where I've never been before. God, would you just help me to stay in my limit zone? You know what I'm talking about? And the question is, is this the kind of faith that God is looking for? I will follow you to this point. Is that what God is looking for? It's not, is it? I mean, if you read Scripture, if you know the essence of following Jesus, it's basically saying, God, I'm going to follow you forsaking all else. Doesn't matter what circumstances I have to go through. If you're there, I'll be okay. That's true faith. And an example of unlimited faith was found in the, the disciples in the New Testament. They encountered imprisoning. They encountered beatings. They encountered, finally, death, saying, I'm going to go through all of it as long as I follow Jesus through it. That's my main desire. And God praises that faith. Jesus at one time told this to his disciples, for, for all those who are struggling with limits. He said this. He said, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children, those are real limits for a lot of people to give up those things in order to follow. But I want you to know, for my sake, they will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Which is to say there is great reward saying, God, I'm going to follow you no matter what, what it means for my job, no matter what it means for my family. I'm going to go to the circumstances you're calling me in to follow you unlimited. And God praises that. But this isn't our natural inclination. And that's the rub. You see, we've got a sinful nature inside of us. And so it's hard to do this. And it's hard to say I'm, I'm ready for that scary situation. And so let's talk about that. Today we encounter the children of Israel, and, and let's get back to our series on Moses. And uh, to catch you up, uh, they have gone out of Egypt uh, through the Red Sea, and they are now on the border of the Promised Land. God was driving them out of Egypt and to get them to the land he promised to them since the time of Abraham. And they are there at the border, and they're seeing what type of land it is. In fact, they sent out 12 spies. And 12 spies just to, to see what has God promised us in this land. And the spies come back with a great report. It's a land filled with great provision, milk and honey. And it was grape season. And uh, here's a bad picture, but they had this big cluster of grapes. To, to me, I think these are just giant grapes, juicy, awesome grapes. Um, and so it was awesome prov prov provisions in this land. But there was a problem. The people of the land were giants. They're called descendants of the Nephilim, which just means they were big people. Big dudes. Um, and they said, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Not only that are they big, but they got fortified cities. 
starting with Jericho and everything else, uh, big walls, how can we untrained slaves go at them? And most of the spies said, we cannot do it. We do not recommend it after our investigation. Two of the spies said, we can do it. We'll talk about that. But what we have before us is their reaction. God was leading them into this land. It was very clear what he wanted them to do and their reaction to what God wanted them to do. Let's, let's get into our lesson for today. Um, top of page 6. There it says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And if you were with us during Moses, this isn't anything new. Right? Last, last lesson. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. They said this many times. But now they change it. Or in this wilderness. <laughs> now they're saying we'd like to die here instead. Why is it that the Lord is bringing us to land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children, they will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Which they were slaves. How would you even go back to that situation? Hey, we're here to be your slaves again. What? And they even went further. They said, and we should choose a leader to go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, uh, who were among those who had explored the land, they tore their clothes. Sign of emotional anger. And they said to the entire assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. And then the glory of the Lord appeared and he showed up at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. This is the word of God. And so we see this great dichotomy of faith. Most of the camp had a limited faith and say, that's too much, we can't do it. And alone too said, no, uh-uh. With God on our side, <laughs> we can do anything. We can take that land. Let's learn from that today. Preseason football is back, and I wanted to see how many are excited to have football back on TV. Cool, cool. Um, and I won't ask what your favorite team is. I don't want a house divided here. Um, that wouldn't be good. But, uh, uh, but I, I will ask this question. How many of you are judging your whole season and how they will do based on that first preseason game? Again, how many are judging the whole season based on the first? So if your team lost, for example... The rest of the road is a bust. We might as not even think about the Super Bowl because it's all done. Now, if you know anything about the NFL, you know that's not a good philosophy. Preseason is a wash. Doesn't really matter. All right, so, so we're okay. Um, a more ridiculous scenario is how many of you would be, would be willing to judge the whole season based on a first snap? So the whole first season based on the one possession. Like if that goes bad, it's going to be, we might as well not even try. That would be even more ridiculous, right? Maybe you'd agree with me? The reason I bring this up is because what the Israelites are doing here is an even worse mentality. Before they step out on the field, before they see what their team can do, before they take a first step, they have a foregone conclusion in their minds. They haven't seen the team. They don't even know the roster. Look what they say in verse 3. Why is the Lord bringing us to the land only to let us fall by the sword? That's what's going to happen. No Super Bowl this year. We're never going to do it. We're doomed. Why? And, and they're not even, again, stepping out. They, they haven't taken the first step across the Jordan to see what might would happen. And they've determined it's a failure. Dear friends, do you, think, do you know I think we do struggle with the same mentality at times? I do. I think there are situations God calls us into. And here I'm not talking about free will, areas of adi offer, like where to work or how, you know, how many kids to have or where to live and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about circumstances you cannot change. Like, kids, it's your will, it's God's will for you to go to school. You cannot stop that from happening. Should happen. Go to school. Right? That's in God's will for you. And, and you might look at that situation and it might be a different year and you might say, Oh no, it's never going to work out. Mm -mm, don't want to do it. Or maybe you know what God is directing you to do in a relationship. You know who you should forgive. You know who you should reach out to. You know what the next step should be. You're just not doing it. God is never going to work out. You don't understand. Mm -mm -mm -mm. We're doomed. 
Maybe it's a relationship with a, a significant other. Maybe in marriage or before marriage, and, you're, and you know what you need to do, you're just not doing it. Never going to work out. Mm-mm-mm. And you know what I think we do at times? We take Romans 8.28 and we flip it on its head. So that Romans 28, 8.28 says this now in our minds. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the bad or the doom of those who love him. And so even, even when it's, it's, it's good things in my life, it's only going to turn out bad. Mm-mm. It's, it's not, we're doomed. Mm-mm. Not going to work out. Mm-mm. And I've struggled with this at times. God, I know what I should do. It's not going to work out. How do you think God should react to this? How do you think God did react to this? Can I share with you that? Well, we heard that the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting. You know what God said, actually, to their response and their fearfulness? Watch out. I will strike them down with a plague and I will destroy them. That's pretty harsh. But does God have a right to do that? He does. The giver of life can take life. He does. But how many of you think God actually does this? Raise your hand. He strikes down someone, which we'll talk about. But he doesn't strike them down. See, the next part of the story is really interesting to me. Moses proves that he's a good leader. And Moses goes and he says, Lord, Lord, would you forgive them? And then he goes on, and Moses is awesome. He says, Lord, would you forgive him? Because remember when you showed up to me, Lord, you told me that you were forgiving, and you told me that you were a compassionate and gracious God, and you told me that you were abounding in love and faithfulness, and so, Lord, would you forgive them? Not because they deserve it, but, Lord, because that's who you are. Forgive them, Lord. And God answers this, and then we hear later, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them, as as he replied. What should God do to us who are at times faithless and not willing to follow him where we know he is calling? He has the right to destroy us and send a plague, doesn't he? That's the brutal reality of our sin. But he doesn't. And that's the amazing reality of grace. He doesn't strike us down because he does strike someone down and that was his son Jesus. And he says, because Jesus came into this world and paid the entire weight of your penalty, you're free. You're free. And as Christians, I believe he esteems a faith that holds him to his promises and believes with faith and says, God, I know I don't deserve this, but because of who you are and because of who Jesus my Savior is, I claim the forgiveness you won for me. Not because of myself and I deserve it, because of what you've done for me. This is the heart of repentance, trusting Jesus, that we are forgiven for any and all sin, even when it was clear what we should have done and didn't do it. That's the grace of God. But how do we move on? How do we get a point where we're not making the same mistake again and living with a limited faith that says, hold up, I'm not going to go there? I think that's where we want to go next. And um, to go there next, I I wanted to know... um, how many of you are doing your doctor's visits before school? Um, like maybe the vision or the dental or the physical. How many are doing those checkups uh, with, with kids before school? Anyone? And uh, we, we, we found a new dentist uh, to go to. We had a dentist appointment to do. And, uh, and it was a new clinic. And if you need a recommendation, I really liked it, but I won't say it here. Um, new experience, and, and uh, they were only open for a year. Well, I was talking to the dental hygienist uh, who told me, you know, it was a real gamble to, to sign up for this. Because, yeah, I was a new dentist and I had a job. It wasn't perfect, but I had a consistent job. And, and I didn't know, was this person going to follow through with what they were saying to me? Were, were, were they, was everything going to work out? with the new clinic take off? Well, it did. And they're doing well a year later. And we talked about the principle of high risk but high reward. High risk and high reward. Have you ever heard that principle before? High risk and high reward. I think that applies to a degree in the situation we're talking about. And here's why. Because I think sometimes it happens where, where God is taking us off of the wizard and he's putting us on the raging bull. And we look at the situation and we look at the drop before us and if we could, we'd say, stop the ride, I want to get off. I am not ready for this. Please, have some mercy. But, If we would look at it from a different angle, this is what I would believe is true if we just stay in there and follow where God is leading. 
that the scarier the situation, the greater opportunity you have to see God's strength in your life. The scarier the situation, the greater opportunity you have to see how God will pull you through. And that's what God wanted for his people. If you don't believe this, let me tell you why I think this is true. Because God's people, after they rejected his plan to follow, they didn't, they didn't go. They were forgiven, but as a consequence, they couldn't go to the promised land. So for the next 40 years, um, everyone ages 20 and up just wandered in the desert, and there they died, and they didn't have any taste of God's goodness in the promised land. Whereas the next generation goes into that land, and they conquer that land. No problem, actually. So well, in fact, that as a reflection on this in the book of Joshua, here was the reflection on what just happened after they had taken the land. It said, I gave them, this is God speaking, I gave them into your hand and I sent the hornet ahead of you. One of my fun things is we're going to talk about that today, the hornet, just cool, um, which drove them out before you also, two Amorite kings. You didn't do it with your own sword and bow. Basically saying, I was going to do this originally, and they could look flat, reflect and look at, at how he did this. And to talk about how he did this, I want to talk about the hornet. When I was going um, through school, one of the mascots that my mom grew up with was a hornet at uh, Northwestern Prep. Uh, did anyone have any favorite mascots? Any favorite mascots? Yeah? Okay, very good, very good. I won't ask for it. But, but I always kind of look down on the hornet. In fact, um, we, we had schools that played close to them, and so we'd bring fly swatters that would swat at the hornet. Um, but after my, my study of what the hornet is, I gained a new uh, uh, appreciation for the hornet. For the hornet, at least here, is not talking about actual hornets, an actual wasp nest. Like, never in Scripture do you read out a nation who is driven out by, by mad bees, you know. Oh, the stings are so much, I have to leave my home. No, that, that's not what happened. And so in studying this, it says, the hornet let out the, the Amorite kings. Um, and so I studied that. And I tried to understand the hornet. And, and it was during those battles against the Amorite kings, one of them was when Joshua asked the Lord to have the sun stand still. And the Lord did that which blows all science and everything. I don't know how, but he had the sun stand still. And if you read that account, um, it was there that God threw the whole army that they were fighting into confusion. And, and he had basically made them afraid. And it was in that account that God actually sent more hailstones to take people than the Israelite swords. And so God did this. And so understanding what the hornet was is this, that... Um, this is an Old Testament con commentator's. Uh, it, it represents a figure that's peculiarly effective terrors. In other words, I believe this was the fear of the Lord that went before the people of Israel um, to confuse them, to make them afraid. And that was how God would work um, for those people to take the land. And if you were here during the Bible series, we, we focused on Rahab, and Rahab said, we are terrified, we're melting in fear because of you. I think that's the hornet at work. Gives me more respect for that mascot, the hornet. That's a tangent. Thank you for going there with me. But to back us back on track, here's the point. Those who said, I will not follow you, missed out, didn't they? They missed out on an experience that could have been awesome. To see the strength of God working in their lives. To see the walls of Jericho fall down and to see the hailstorm, to see the sun stand still and to see everyone just terrified and the Lord fighting for them but they missed it because they didn't follow. You and I who don't ask to be on the track of the raging bull, maybe we can switch our focus and say, maybe this isn't what I would have chosen but guess what? I'm going to see God's strength and his power here and I'm going to follow him with what I know is right and what I know what to do. And in so doing, I believe that you will see how God can carry you through that situation and work on your behalf. I'm not sure if he's going to send the hornet. He probably won't. Uh, like a football team, I'm not sure he's going to send a hornet against the other football team. Sorry. Um, but he will work in your life, dear friends. Which leads to another point. Whose strength is this all about? Is it about ours? It's about his. And that's what the two spies, Caleb and Joshua, claimed. If you look back at their unlimited faith and their confession, look at verse 9. They said, Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we'll devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. In other words, they might be big and bad, but they don't know that our God is bigger and badder and better. And with him on our side, 
There is nothing we cannot do. You know, it was that same spirit in one of the most famous Old Testament stories of David and Goliath. We have young little David, who's a teenager, scrawny boy. And when he comes before their hero, this giant who's nine feet tall and a champion, does David say, you better be afraid of me. I'm really strong and I did my push-ups. No, he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And you might be big and bad, but you don't know who you're messing with. He's bigger and badder and he can do this. And so for you, my friends, when we're considering following where God is leading us, it may not be easy, but with him as our strength, he can lead us to do what he's calling us into. And he can be our strength, and we'll be witnesses of that. Final point. Final point I want you to consider is the land that they were brought, being brought into. The report came back, and what kind of land was it? Verse 3. Um, excuse me, verse, verse 7. It says, The land we pass through is exceedingly good. Now, in my Hebrew translation, this was my favorite portion to translate from Hebrew. Because in Hebrew, it said, It was good, much, much. Or it was very, very good. And I always think that's silly. Like, children use, like, the very, very, very. Like, it's not just good. It's very, very good. You know, and it's a silly emphasis, but I like it. In fact, when I pray the Lord's Prayer, one of my favorite parts is saying forever and ever. Like, forever would have covered it, right? But just so we're clear, ever is also covered. And so what God is saying is this land, it's not just good. It's not just very good. It's very, very good. That's how good it is. And this is what he desired for his people. An awesome land filled with milk and honey and clusters of grapes and every provision they could imagine. His desire for them wasn't just good. It wasn't just very good. It was very, very good. You know one of the reasons we stop in our tracks from following God? We're not convinced it's good. We aren't. We are not convinced that his way for us might be good. We do struggle. I know better. I know it won't work out. It won't be good if I follow you where it's clear. But I want you to know it's not just good what God desires for you. It's not just very good what God desires for you. It's very, very good. God's laws are good. His direction is good. They keep us from harm. They keep us safe. This does not mean it will be easy to follow. And it doesn't mean earthly success. Sometimes that very, very good is just a closer walk with Jesus in a way that is just awesome and more indescribable than earthly goods. But it's very, very good. So dear friends, with forgiveness, knowing that the Lord is our strength, may he give us faith to follow unlimited. I go on it all, even the sick machine, because you're with me. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends our understanding may